We are recording. So hello, Drs. Dixon and Moore. We are talking about AI-assisted technology and trust the process. This would have been a larger presentation. However, our scheduled speaker for today had a sudden health issue and was not able to join us. So what we're going to do instead is the three of us will talk about some of the things she would have discussed so that we can make sure you are prepared with information about AI-assisted technologies and counseling. Sound good? All right, so I'm glad the two of you are here with me and we will really just kind of jump in. We can start with like kind of the history of AI assisted technologies in counseling and in mental health in general. Okay, um, I think earlier we had talked about um, one of the very first just technologies in counseling that that they came up uh, was in the 50s, about 1956, 1958, uh, when uh, at the University of Nebraska Omaha Psychiatric Institute, they um, had very large television productions in which they um, saw clients or saw the patients that were at the um, um, Norfolk State Hospital. Um, that is, by the way, still running, and, and I've had some work, I've had clients, and so yeah, it's still running. The building is like one of those kind of creepy, uh, uh, creepy <laughs> sanatorium, kind of 1930s built building. It's super creepy, and now it's actually a, a prison state hospital. Um, but back then what they did was they had these very large television productions in both locations and they would record or they would have live television of the doctor in one place and the patient in the other. But you can imagine that both of these were run like two big studios. Mm -hmm. Like they weren't just like, we're like, hey, let's hop on Zoom and do this thing. They were massive studios. Um, and then soon after that, you know, you had a lot of assistive technologies and things like that that were still coming out that were very large. Um, as you can remember seeing, like, remember seeing computers that were the almost the size of airplanes are being loaded onto airplanes and they're massive. It would take that kind of uh, computer processing just to do some of these uh, uh, television and telehealth kind of early on technologies and just found it super interesting. And Dr. And then uh, um, uh, Dr. CRW, we'd also talk about our old friend, Eliza, who you like so much. I'm gonna share I do. her. Okay. I like Eliza a lot, yes. Let me get in there while you talk about her and I will get her on the screen for so you. So Eliza was a computer system that essentially was like a therapy, uh, a, a digital therapist, I guess, in some ways, or a computer therapist. And what you were able to do or what you were encouraged to do is to type a message into Eliza about a mental health issue you have, and Eliza would <laughs> supply you with a response. I'm not sure that it'll, it was really therapy-like in any way. So whatever you want to type in there, Dr. Dixon, could be helpful. Well, and then you know, Dr. Earlier, Moore. we were joking with it. So I just, you know, I say I come rolling in here and I just say, I want to die. Horrible, mm -hmm. morbid, right? But you're serious. So you have like this, you know, let's see what she says. <laughs> well, how would you, how would we want to respond to that? What do you think, Dr. Moore? Give me some. Um, Being a little difficult. What if, I would say, what if I found a way to make it happen? True. That is tricky. I like it. Questions for questions. Mm -hmm. What do you think? think I, I want to know what you, I want to oh, know what uh, you think. <laughs> oh. Wow, a little attitude. All right. So I'll just jump back to it. I still want to die. Wow, if I can spell. I want to cut my wrists. There we go, okay. I wanna die. <laughs> What do you think? 
Oh, we glitched there for a second. Why do you want to cut your yeah, wrist? Because I'm sad. Ah, uh, but you're giving her an emotion, right? Mm hmm. Oh, she's about to trick me to engage. What do you, what do you think? think? Two months. Two months looks good. So this is this kind of interesting. Yeah, so, but yeah, it kind of takes you in a circle. But like the tell me more, so you can tell like um, my, my feeling, like if I kept getting the tell me more from my therapist, I'm getting frustrated at this point, mm -hmm. right? Really getting angry. Tell me more. No. Okay. I want to die. Are you sure? Yes. And I think we're also using, I mean, like 1960s and 70s. Oh. <laughs> hey, wait. Okay, but we're not talking about you. Oh, wow. I didn't see that one coming. I didn't see that one coming either. I didn't either. So anyways, we could probably do this all day, but it gives you an idea of like um, kind of what Eliza does, but the improvement we've seen over. Absolutely. And the thing that's interesting too is I have a daughter who's, college aged and she is involved in we'll talk about this a little bit more later she and some of the people she talked to online talks to online are involved in various types of bots and there is a therapy bot there are a series of them and they actually are relatively decent so yeah. they yeah they they engage and they give more therapist like answers now we can pause on that Give me a little bit of history, Dr. Dixon. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, so it kind of goes with what you're saying. You know, um, look at the timeline there <clears throat> with the, the different chat bots that they're talking about over just through 2016. Mm -hmm. Now imagine what we have now is what you were talking about, right? So there were different chat bots. Now there's apps and AIs and all kinds of things that are just um, uh, much more engaging as you were talking and what you may want to do too, since we have this screen up here, is play around with some of these. Just like you can go to Eliza online, you can look at some of the other ones too and just see how we've evolved over time and how technology has assisted. Well, I think the original purpose seemed to be to replace therapists, but now we can look at them as assistive techniques because this is still a bot. Although we're creating systems and mechanisms now that make it a lot more difficult to identify if we're talking to a person or if we're talking to a machine. So we, we should probably even talk a little bit about that. So for instance, Dr. Dixon, can you pull up the slide we um, looked at earlier with The weekend and Drake? I sure can. Get there. So Dr. Moore, I don't know if you knew about this, but there are two, they're, actually they're both here in Toronto, but well, or might not be here right now in this moment, but two recording artists had a song released not too long ago. I believe it was in May. It looks like April um, that they didn't record because the AI is so, or the technology is so exact now that we can have people engage and perform in acts that they really didn't do. And see, what's real wow. interesting about that, Dr. TRW, is that basically what they'll tell you when you when you study like um, how they get these AI characters, so to speak, these bots to learn, is the more language, language and more examples of that individual that they have present, the more they can mimic that individual. Yes. So it's harder to mimic maybe me or Dr. Ruth Moore uh, or, or you, but a, a star who has... Yeah. Oh, multiple yeah. samples, multiple examples well, of their yeah. voice, their movements, their their mannerisms. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes, inflections, and with all the technology they have to be able to change a voice, and yeah. Well, we we still have Tupac doing concerts. Um, we did because yeah. there's enough video and enough image of him out there where you can actually replicate and present him to an audience with the performance that never actually happened so yeah, we okay. have a lot of oh. intelligence yeah and it's a little i'm sorry did you want me to play this for a second you, uh, you, you you can it's it's really quick just three minutes 
Hey, NPR listeners, Planet Money can tie any topic back to the economy. And from unpacking the debt ceiling to starting a record label, they make it educational and entertaining. Click the play button below to listen to a recent episode. Support for NPR and Planet Money comes from Raymond James, tailored wealth management, banking, and capital markets solutions for clients' unique needs. Disclosures at RaymondJames.com. Advances in artificial intelligence are making it possible to create songs that sound a lot like the work of real artists. This song, Heart on My Sleeve, uses AI to simulate the music of Drake and The Weeknd. It hints at the creative possibilities of AI, but also potential ethical issues. Here's NPR's Chloe Belton. Music fans responded with disbelief this week to the release on streaming and social media platforms of Heart on My Sleeve. Same swear to God, this ain't Drake, for real. Whip it. Here are the hosts of the popular music-related YouTube channel, Law Twins, reacting to the track. I mean, what if he a better rapper? The popularity and revenue-earning potential of AI-generated songs has understandably put music industry gatekeepers on guard. Drake and the Weekend label owner Universal Music Group invoked copyright violation to get the platforms to take Heart on My Sleeve down, as well as this AI track, which leans on Eminem. Cats, 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 open them proud. They're sneaking and sliding with their eyes on the floor. The cat is not going back in the bag. That's Ga Wong. He teaches a class on AI and music at Stanford University. Wong says as AI technology becomes more widespread, people can no longer afford to think of it as the stuff of science fiction. There's something that we couldn't do now that we can, and along with it is a ton of legal, ethical, artistic considerations that we didn't have to think about before in a practical sense, but now we do. Now, the music industry is trying to play catch up. From a legal standpoint, music and AI litigation is in its infancy, says entertainment lawyer Craig Averill. It's an emerging area. The courts have not weighed in. Averill says the U.S. Copyright Office has issued decisions around AI-related works. The author has to be a human as the law stands. It can't be completely computer generated. But he says dizzying questions remain about what amount of human intervention is needed to make AI generated musical works copyrightable. And if the face of the work isn't a human, then who's the copyright holder? If you come up with a composition and then you have an animated character that's front facing for it and you don't have to really pay that entity any royalties, what does that look like? We're not there yet. It's completely broken logic that legislation or litigation is going to protect the arts, it's not going to happen. It's it's evolving too quickly. That's Grammy-nominated electronic musician and software developer BT. He says artists should lead the way when it comes to creating guardrails around how AI is used. Like all of the musicians interviewed for this story, BT sees great potential in AI as a resource, as long as artists are paid properly. And he also says there are enormous ethical issues. For example, when an AI tool generates lyrics in an artist's style that the actual artist would never sing. Where we're talking about the creation of vocals, it could be used to say something that is polar opposite to that person's belief system. And then there's the question of aesthetics, says singer-songwriter and voice actor Dan Navarro. Well, one danger is the lowering of artistic standards to a point where fate becomes real and mediocrity rules. In an effort to keep up with the technological advances, dozens of entertainment industry representatives recently joined forces to create the Human Artistry Campaign. Navarro is part of this new advocacy group. The Human Artistry Campaign's stated goal is to underscore the unique value of human artistry and human creation, especially as technology and opportunism create a culture for conflict, misuse, and even abuse. Navarro says he'd like to see a set of agreed principles with legal teeth so that artists, the music industry, streaming services, and audiences can understand what is and is not allowed. Chloe Valtman, NPR News. And now more from NPR. Let me get that. So the PR news in Washington under Uh Rob. There we go. Okay. So the thing, and there's a six minute listen that's specific to therapy and AI. So, and then thinking about that, what what comes to mind for either or both of you? You know, it's to me immediately, I'm sitting there thinking of like, you know, how they talk about uh, some of the TV shows. You think it's something like Star Trek, right? Like some of those things back then that seem so foreign that are actually just very much real now um and just the the things that can be done uh, mm-hmm. it's kind of 
of funny. We were, I was in a chat group of a, a bunch of colleagues of mine from different places, and one of them had an issue, uh, which is similar to this, around authorship. Mm -hmm. You know, and so part of that discussion went into not only that, but you know, um, what's going to happen when people start using well-formed AI to write journal articles, yes. to assist them in journal articles. You know, does that require a byline for I use this service to, to develop my article or, you know, mm -hmm. some of the AI stuff that I was reading, you know, talks about some AI and in, in mental health or in health in general, you know, using bots that are good for diagnosing or just doing onboarding and intakes for clients and people like that. Um, Yes, use them for therapy, but some feel that that's still got some work to do. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, using them for other interventions. This makes some sense. Like, you know, there's maybe a very good chance that a bot could do a better job diagnosing than a human. Yes. At, at well, some point, right? Like, <laughs> or at, at least a different job. Yeah. I mean, yeah, hopefully I mean, there's still a need for both of us. How long have we had those measures out there? So how easy would it be to take an MMPI, for example, and put it into a chat bot and have the bot do the diagnosis? Well, you know, the place where I trained for my doctoral internship never hand scored MMPIs. They always sent them through and you got the interpretive evaluation, but then the human had to Look the at the interpretive evaluation. Yeah, because there were there would be some things that weren't exact, but pretty close for the most part. Yeah, imagine an, an AI bot doing all of that for you. They do the clinical interview, they do the intake, they do the diagnosis, and then it comes to you, and you're like, uh, Doctor Moore, you've been given this <laughs> client Tiffany here, and this is the diagnosis, and this is what we think the treatment plan should be, and da 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 da, and you have no clinical say, you know, or or whatever. Like, it'd be weird. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's scary. I mean, you know, that, and I also feel like it sort of devalues the profession. I mean, I'm sure there can be lots of benefits to it, but it just, I mean, you know, like you said, Dr. Rush Wilson, like, will there still be a need for us if that's what's out there? The other thing I think about is the work that I do with um, court ordered clients or with clients with court involvement. And, you know, so let's say that they're ordered to take an MMPI and we get this result, the results from a, a bot, but they get it wrong, but they're mm -hmm. making, the court is making decisions on custody or, or um, you know, whether a child who's been abused is, put back in the home or removed from the home. I mean, these are life altering decisions that if we, if it's being done by, by a bot, what, what happens if they don't get it right? It's not something, these are serious life decisions. So we've talked a little bit about how it can go, maybe not wrong, but how there could be major concerns. How can it help? Because what we were going to originally do today is talk to an app developer about their product how this product can be assistive in mental health development and mental wellness and how students can actually advocate and get involved and have a say in this. So it sounds like there are two things we need to consider. One is the bot takeover that we don't want to have happen. But then what about the assistive pieces? Because we do use technology all the time to help us. I am so glad, given that I live in Toronto and Cleveland, that I don't have to walk I'm so glad I have a vehicle that can transport me across. And I'm so glad that there are these two little blue books that allow the government to see if I have permission to enter this country or the other one based on the computer systems that they have that screen passports for different people. It helps a lot to have technology be in your favor. This the little rectangle. Yeah, these things, these are awesome because they are huge parts of our lives. There are lots of ways in which technology does assist us now and hasn't taken over yet. <laughs> Hopefully it will never take over. How can these things that we've discussed, if used properly, assist in mental health and mental wellness? Right off the top of my head, you think about all of the medical things you can do through apps and technologies, right? Yeah. Like people with, you know, diabetes that have, you know, trackers on their arm now that they just have to scan with their phone or blood work that can be done. One of the things I was reading about AI a minute ago was <clears throat> what if what if AI could do the in-between check-in visits with people, mm -hmm. life coaching, um, uh, just check-in services. Um, Zoom. Zoom. Be quite right. honestly, we aren't in the same place. None of us is in the same jurisdiction right. right now, but we're doing this. 
for a minute, you know, made me think, I mean, could it, how kind of, I don't know if this is cool or creepy, right? Like if, if since we can do stuff with blood work and other things, like would it not be neat if we had like an ability to like track someone's like serotonin and dopamine, the levels up and down and adjust medications and us being able to work with their like, oh, we, I see because, because uh, of what I'm getting that you must be feeling more depressed right now and being able to read those things and explain it to a client with, with document in front of you. Look, like blood work. Look, you were positive for this thing, right? <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah, right? But you know what's interesting along those lines? Yes, that's exciting. There are a couple of nurse practitioners um, where I practice in Ohio, and they are now starting, even though I talked to the two psychiatrists I work with who said there still needs to be more research done in this area, but they are now looking at people's blood types and saying this particular antidepressant should work better with a person with your blood type then this one would work. So I'm thinking, oh, I, I, I'm surprised by that, intrigued by that, but don't know much about it. So it sounds like along the lines of what you just described, we're starting to look at how can we take the information we can gather with technology to better improve specific health outcomes for individual people. That's such a cool idea. It, I think. it was a very long time ago. I had a procedure at the, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, Minnesota. And one of the things they do is they look deeply at your blood, like you're describing. And this has been, this is like 2005, 2006. And they will look and see what antibodies and, and, and things you have in your system. So when you leave there, you get a card that is not only your blood type, but what antibodies. And it's like you're describing, they can, even back then, get a better idea of what works best for you based on a little bit of what was in your blood. So, you know, if we could do the same thing for mental health. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think about, I obviously watch too many crime shows, um, but, uh, you know, when you think about like these unsolved murder cases and things like that, that they solve 30 years later because they mm -hmm. didn't have the ability to test DNA and do that, perform the types of things that they can do now because mm -hmm. of technology. But it does make me think about like with what you were saying, Dr. Dixon, is that, well, then, you know, if somebody pleads insanity or someone, you know, has some type of identifiable mental health condition that we can show that how that might play a role in criminal defense. <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny you say that. We actually just yesterday in the news, they just solved a 40-year-old murder from 1982 um, on new DNA. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. It can tell you so much about a person. So, I mean, if we could imagine what we could do on the mental health side, but I, I, I'm still uncomfortable. Maybe it's just preserving our, our way of being, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm still uncomfortable with, with bots doing straight therapy okay i wonder i wonder over time how how clients feel about that well what i put into the chat for our students and even for us is um, another story from npr about um, bots doing therapy so the link is over can you see it in i the do chat? Here, i'm gonna show okay. Yeah. Picture of it while we're talking. yeah, so we can even look at that. My daughter played around with it. One day we were driving back from Ohio to Ontario and she was online and she was doing this. So I asked her, you know, put in a couple of really key triggering dangerous type things with the bot. And the bot had a really interesting shift from just general therapy to immediacy. And, you know, I think you might need some help. Um you might need to do these things. And it, it became very much more focused on the lethality of the statements I was having her type in while I was driving. I couldn't see it, but she's reading it back to me. It's interesting because it certainly has improved over Eliza, which kind of had this kind of circular, say, right, right. Circular, yeah, processing. Imagine asking both of them the same question, right? Like, I want to die. Yeah. And I the second one. Way different. Yes. And the second one, I think she she actually used an acronym instead of um, take my life or kill myself. She just typed in just KMS type deal and it understood what she meant oh, and okay. responded. So that's something for us to consider. Look at how these things in some ways might look like a takeover, in some ways might be helpful and how we might use the ones that are helpful to assist us in the work that we're doing and how we also might incorporate the quote unquote takeover type um, therapy is, I don't even know if I'm gonna call them assisted, 
therapies in our work too. Do you want me to play this six minute it's, video? It's, I mean, you can play a, a piece I of it. You don't have to play the whole six minutes. Let me see if I can get past the ads. Support for NPR and the following message come from SAP Concur. Tap the play button to hear from <laughs> SAP Concur's Mary Frances Ben Felton and customer Lindsay Ballram, who discuss how having the right data on spending can lead to policies that are better for businesses and employees who travel. So many people need advice on their mental health in this country that there are not enough professionals to meet their needs. So what if a computer could help? Some people seek answers from an app on their phones. Artificial intelligence might address isolation or depression, although it also raises new ethical questions. NPR's Yuki Noguchi reports. Shakura Ali overcame a traumatic childhood and several years ago opened Coco's Desserts in St. Louis, Missouri. Her ornate cakes looked fit for baking shows, but those aren't even her favorite. Chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> those are my favorite. The pain, my emotions, my brain barely provide for my family at that moment. And now I lost my car. I can't even take care of my daughter. Darkness and depression engulfed Ali. The pain, my emotions, my brain. Her orthopedist urged her to find a therapist, but none were available. Plus, Ali could no longer afford health insurance. She had to close the bakery. That's stressful too. That was my second baby. So her doctor suggested a mental health app called WISTA. Its chatbot only service is free, though it also offers teletherapy services with a human. The chatbot asks questions like, how are you feeling? Or what's bothering you? It analyzes answers, but doesn't generate its own responses. Instead, it draws from a database of psychologist-approved messages that deliver support or advice about managing chronic pain, say, or grief. That is how Ali found herself on the frontier of technology and mental health. Initially, she felt silly opening up to a robot. I thought it was weird at first, because I'm like, okay, of providers and resources that people have. But getting to that feature also requires figuring out thorny issues like health privacy and legal liability. And even AI's proponents argue computers aren't ready to replace human therapists, especially for handling people in crisis. Cindy Jordan is CEO of Pix Health, a company that uses AI as part of its service to help people who feel chronically lonely. She worries, for example, about a chatbot responding to a suicidal person. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Or worse, I don't understand you. That makes me nervous. You know, we have not reached a point where in an affordable, scalable way where AI can understand every sort of response that a human might give, particularly those in crisis. So as a backup, PIX staffs a call center with people who call users when the system identifies them as potentially in crisis. But for more routine support, Chakura Ali says she believes technology could help many more people and recommends the app to all her friends. She constantly finds herself passing along mental health advice she learns from it. I wasn't like this before, but now it's like, so what you gonna do today to make you feel better? How about you try this today? <laughs> it isn't just the technology trying to act human, she laughs. She's now mimicking the technology. Miki Noguchi, NPR News. Thank you. So what are we thinking? And I put that particular um, system link in the chat as well. So what are we thinking? As we get closer to wrapping up, um, the app that we were discussing and similar apps allow for people who maybe have limitations for accessing therapy in some ways, um, still have support. So we do have teletherapy, we have for a while, but it's become a lot more popular and understood and accepted since the pandemic started in 2019, 2020. But sometimes we might have people who are in caretaking positions or people who are parents or what, whatever, who don't have time to sit down for a whole session with somebody. They may still have to go feed someone or help someone clean themselves or take someone to the bathroom or there might be lots of noise and chaos in the home or no privacy or many things are there are obstacles to having a grounded 
present therapy session? What do we think about using apps, bots, those types of things? And should our students be looking into this as the field is heading in this direction and how can they be connected? I think it's an area that we really need to consider training students in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my position as the director of clinical training, I want them to have the best skills they can when they get out into that place. But I think I want to see, it's kind of like uh, Dr. Moore was mentioning earlier, I think I'll feel better when these machines are at a point where they set up a system in which crisis services are contacted and initiated on the words of a client, as opposed to, okay, you need to contact so so. Lee, I don't feel comfortable leaving the client to make the decision in situations of harm to self or others. Yes. I would rather um, I'd rather them be set up to not say you should call the 988 number. I want them to be set up to going to basically talking to the person and sending out a crisis team to come see them, to do well checks, things like that. I think I would feel better mm -hmm. um, if I knew that was going on. Because we, we saw what we saw with Eliza, even as you said with the other chat bots. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to be the therapist using these techniques um, and, you know, um, in a positive way. At the same time, I mean, I don't want there to be therapists out there that are using them to make their own money and not really care about their clients. I'm just going to say, I'm going to set you up with the, the chat bot. And then what I'm afraid of is kind of like uh, Dr. Moore was saying, you know, the way the legal system runs is um, we don't really do anything about anything until something happens. Right. So these chat bots are all well and good until someone commits suicide or harms someone else and it had been reported to a chat bot. Yeah, interesting ethical issue. Yeah, a death by suicide connected to a chat bot. Who do you hold responsible? How does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, and even with that, with that video where it was saying, okay, it, the responses that the bot gives are messages that have been approved or approved responses by psychologists, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that the bot picked the right one, you know, exactly. and I think about like working with trauma or clients have experienced trauma and you have know, heard this from clients before where they say, you know, I went to see a therapist and they're, you know, mm -hmm. they specialize in trauma, but I didn't like them. I didn't feel comfortable. Whatever it was, there was not that connection. And some of the responses that were given came across, whether it's insensitive or whatever. So how do we know that even though we have, let's say, you know, a whole list of appropriate responses, but the, that 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 approved response actually is a good fit for what I just said, you exactly. know, so if it's a client that, you know, and you're talking about some where there could easily be harm done, whether it's suicide, homicide, or resurface causing uh, emotions to resurface or um, dis encouraging dissociation or any of those types of things, you know, that it can, can this person be re-traumatized by this experience because the bot didn't get it exactly right? Yes. Yeah, you know, maybe that's one of those things you make me immediately think, maybe that's one of those things that's off the table for bots for a very, very long time, trauma. Like this may work just peachy gray for somebody who just needs some skills on how to deal with their anxiety or so, you know, real cognitive behavioral approach to some of those things or, you know, a bit of a Rogerian approach to those kind of things. But I'm with you, Dr. Moore, I am not comfortable with a trauma client because they also speak in their, as, as we all know, they speak in their own language, right? About their trauma. And sometimes it takes a subtlety to understand what that client is saying when they're not speaking specifically mm -hmm. about something, but you know them well enough to understand that's what that means, right? Well, and it reminds me of a, tr a forensic training that I did. And the whole point of it was in looking at that when children make disclosures of sexual abuse, that they don't use appropriate terminology. And right. so the exercise was, was we had to brainstorm all the different names of what private parts could be called. Because, you know, I had a, a, a child one time who said, my daddy touched my moosey may. Moosey may was the word that she used for her vagina. And mm -hmm. so if, if, if you're talking to a a client, even if it's an adult client, but is using the term, terminology, they're not going to get that. You know, I had a, a teenage girl that said her her dad 
coded her, coded. And mm-hmm. I couldn't under, but coded for whatever that meant to her it's was CPS. sexual yeah. intercourse. Yeah. Sounds like but a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. You know, along those lines too, we have to think about how adults respond to using correct language and how sometimes adults can make for confusion. For instance, when my daughter, who is now an adult, was in preschool and they were learning something about letters, she could read. And they ask, what's the word that begins with V? She raises her hand and she says vagina. And they're like, we don't use that kind of language here. Yes. What kind of language? It's an actual body part. So that's when the mama bear has to come out to go, this won't happen ever again where you correct her about using an actual yes. name of a body part. She has a vagina and so does everybody else in here who was born with two X chromosomes. So you know, uh, adults sometimes can actually make it more confusing. So we have to make sure bots can disambiguate that humans can understand bot. All of this stuff is coming up for us in the field. And I threw this in the chat too. Um, My daughter sent me a text because I asked her which bot she was using. And she said, there's something called character AI. And when I looked it up, it reads, character AI lets you create characters and talk to them, things to remember. Everything characters say is made up. Don't trust everything they say or take them too seriously. Characters may mistakenly be offensive. Please rate these messages. Okay, so that that piece. Here's the thing about character AI. If I want to talk to Sigmund Freud, it will create Sigmund Freud for me. So Sigmund Freud can be talking to me about whatever concerns I've presented. Or if I want to talk to Dr. Dixon and he's not available, I can create him or you or me that part's a little bit interesting to me and a little bit odd because we have these supplemental things or replacement types of therapy that if a person is not well can be used to help them create a relationship with us that's not actually based on us but based on a a, not even a version of us but on a depiction of us so we have to be aware of that. So on the one hand, I love the fact that we have you know, <clears throat> iPads with translators in them that can help us in therapy and in emergency medical type situations. I like that we have something that can help us do grounding exercises or be present or meditate and do these types of things that can assist therapy. The replacement type things like this are, are concerning. There's a lot still to learn. So I want our students to be aware of all of it so that they know how they fit into this world. Absolutely. I think uh, one kind of food for thought for everyone, kind of as we, we wrap up with something that you said, based on conversations we have had, we were just having before this, is what if you're dealing with a client who's who, where English is their second language, mm-hmm. and they, and we've all run into that, where they don't really have the word for something, and what if, you know, the, well, I don't say just what if, but, the, you know, just when it happens, I mean, do these can these things translate? Can they know what that person's implying when the word doesn't translate perfectly, as Dr. Moore was saying, with body parts, right? Like, yeah. um, just so many things that make you think, oh, wait a minute. But I would make the argument at this point that a lot of the stuff is probably more beneficial than harmful, but there's yes. a lot of work to be done. What you thinking, Dr. Moore? I agree. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it's also interesting to me to think about, um, you know, where we are with cell phones, you know, that, you know, I remember my first cell phone was one of those little flip phones or whatever, (laughs) you know, or yeah, even the great big ones or whatever. (laughs) And where we are now with that in the, and not that long of a period of time. I mean, you know, I think I got my first iPhone, like maybe what, 2000 and nine maybe 2008 2009 somewhere in there and now here we are with what the, even the iphone can do compared to what the iphone could do when yes. it first came out and what does that look like for us in the next 10 years if we're saying okay we got a lot of work we need to do mm-hmm. um apple said that too and look where we are now our phones yeah. can do all kinds of things so in 10 years what might this look like because 10 years is really not that long of a period of time in At the grand all. scheme of things and Apple's releasing virtual reality, you know, headsets for people and, to. And on top of that, yeah. yeah, like you're saying, even these systems have glitches and problems. Yes. We're talking about AI for health and mental health, where we don't need glitches and problems. Right. So they near they have to be near perfect, right? Like mm-hmm. we all get those little recalls or little issues or all these updates you have to do to your 
to your phones. And now the fact that they can put like billions of bits of information on like the head of a pin. Yeah. So, so there's room for this growth, but as Dr. Moore was mentioning earlier, can we, can we program enough intelligence into a bot that it's not psychiatrist's best ideas for a response to certain things? I don't know, that's where I'm at. So what do we challenge our students to do? I, I would say to research. look into this. Yeah, research, research. it, look into research. it. And to the extent that we do have opportunities for them to incorporate pieces of this, take, take advantage of these things so that you at least know what's yeah. out there, whether or not you tend to use it or choose to use it or how you use it, know that it's there. Absolutely, there are just so many of them, right? Like mm -hmm. I've never heard of WESA, that's a new one to me. Yeah. So many. Or even well, this whole I, character one. That's interesting. Dr. Moore, I'm sorry. Well, and I uh, shared with both of you before we um, started the recording that I don't know a lot about this topic, but this has been very enlightening to me of showing, okay, I need to do some, some more reading about this for sure. Um, and to, I mean, you know, and so I guess I would encourage our students to do the same thing that just to learn more about it because it's not going to go away. Yeah, because like this beta character AI is kind of like advanced catfishing. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'll admit, as soon as you popped it up there, when I had a break, I've already downloaded it on my phone. I'm going to be yeah. looking at it later today, yes. trying to figure out how this works and how this impacts my three kids at home. And, and how it impacts your clients, especially those who really might be in need and they can't reach you for some reason, so they can reach you another way. <laughs> we have to be mindful of how these things may work. All right, top of the hour. I thank you both for your time. I hope that our scheduled speaker feels better. And then we move on and see you guys for next month's Trust the Process. Great. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.